Our first conversation is helping us think about the challenges that the Navy will face in 2030 and beyond. And to help us envision that topic and that idea, we are joined, have the pleasure of being joined by Admiral John Richardson, who is serving as the 31st Chief of the Naval Operations, and he's been doing that since 2015. Admiral Richardson graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1982 with a Bachelor's of Science in Physics. He holds master's degrees in electrical engineering from MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and national security strategy from the National War College. He has served as both Commodore and Commander several times, as well as Chief of Staff to the U.S. Naval Forces Europe and U.S. Naval Forces Africa. His staff assignments have included duty in the Attack Submarine Division of the Chief of Naval Operations Staff, Naval Aid to the President, and Director of Strategy and Policy at U.S. Joint Forces Command. The conversation will be moderated by our, our very own CEO extraordinaire, Anne-Marie Slaughter, whom you've met already. But a little about Anne-Marie's background is that prior to becoming CEO of New America, she served as the Director of Policy and Planning for the U.S. Department of State and was the first woman to hold that position. And before then, she was Dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs from 2002 to 2009. And before then, Professor of International Foreign and Comparative Law at Harvard Law School. So our very distinguished uh, leaders for this morning, please join me in thanking them for the conversation. Thank you. So good morning again. So we have we have lots of things to cover. I know um, I'm not sure who set that up that the Army managed to get its imagining the future in on the video before the Navy got here. But uh, we're, 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 Ghost Brigade. We're giving, I mean, I can't, I can't compete with the Ghost <laughs> exactly. Brigade. Exactly. Uh, although Ghost Fleet uh, is uh, Peter right. Singer's <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful novel. If any of you have not read it, you absolutely should. So I've been reading uh, some of your testimony and some of your speeches, and, and I can't help noticing uh, that you, you have a, the Navy gets a big boost from our first president. Uh, George Washington said, I'm not sure if I can quote it exactly, but he essentially seems to have said, without a Navy, we can't do anything. With a Navy, we can do everything that is honorable and glorious. Just, right pretty good way to start uh, anything. And I thought, we're, gonna, we're talking about the future of war. We're talking about the fu future of the Navy. And I've got a lot of specific questions. But one of the things I'm most interested in is when, when George Washington was talking, he was talking about the Navy as ships, right? There were ships, and there were sailors, and they <laughs> sailed the different places. And of course, they had naval combat. And they still do that. But when you talk about ships, and actually when you talk about ships and planes and all the different uh, par parts of the Navy, you talk about them as platforms. So I'm going to start by asking you just to reflect on that big change, that you now think of a ship or a plane as a platform. Well, uh, maybe if I could just back up a little bit and uh, talk about why we start with that quote. Uh, and uh, the quote talks about, hey, without a Navy, we can do nothing decisive. Okay. And with it, everything <laughs> honorable and glorious. And so your question really goes to the idea of what makes a Navy decisive. Yes. And we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about that, right? That's really what our our uh, strategy goes uh, towards, and, and then whether we call them platforms or ships or whatever, uh, we go towards uh, putting together the right mix of those things uh, to deliver a Navy to the nation that is decisive. But the other reason that uh, we uh, start with that more and more is that we are taking every opportunity that we can to go back to what I would say is first principles. And it, I think is very much a theme that we have in common uh, that, uh, this honorable and glorious part is as important as the decisive part. And uh, you know, George Washington, our first president, has a lot of street cred <laughs> in the uh, founding father uh, group. And um, if we think about what the Navy uh, 
can do for the nation. Certainly, we contribute to the military dimension of national power, and we'll talk a lot about that. Uh, but in addition, we also, a, a quick scan of our history shows that the Navy is deeply involved in the diplomatic element of national power. And so if we think about the role of the Navy in diplomacy, very, very important, it, it, up to this day. Uh, a, a Navy ship visits a foreign port, the U.S. ambassador to that country will host a reception on U.S. sovereign territory, that right. Navy ship. Uh, and then, uh, just like uh, George Washington did, and particularly Thomas Jefferson, one of the very first missions the Navy undertook was to go overseas to the Strait of Gibraltar to protect our trade against the Barbary pirates at the time. And uh, we still do a lot of that. That's why we are deployed around the world, to make sure that the Navy continues to meet its responsibilities to contribute to the economic dimension of national power. And then, all in the service of the value proposition that the United States presents to the world. And so this idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, so important for us to uh, center up on that. And so we begin a lot of our uh, discussions, both internally in the Navy and externally, reminding ourselves of those founding principles so that uh, when somebody meets a U.S. Navy sailor, that might be the first actual you know, manifestation of the United States that they meet. So it's important that all of our folks understand that we certainly are part of the military dimension of power, but also diplomatic, also economic, all in the service of these values. So that's really why we start with that. Now, to your, to your question, I think that uh, as we start to uh, appreciate the uh, Anything that can contribute, you know, certainly platforms, the only thing that uh, George Washington was thinking about was ships, right, sailing ships. And then as you just sort of track the uh, progress of technology through, well, we've introduced more things that can deliver naval power that, uh, over time. And so uh, it's just become more complicated. You have to stop thinking about uh, these things as uh, almost as individual things, but also how they can contribute in a combined way. And so you start to generalize them to these, this idea of platforms, some thing that can deliver uh, naval power. So whether that's a submarine or a, a satellite or a plane, this integrated and net, uh, distributed but networked vehicle for delivering na naval power. Right, so that it operates together with everything else. And, uh, and then we can't uh, forget the human dimension of, of naval power as well, which... I'm going to come to. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <right. laughs> so with that overview, uh, and I, I do think, I remember reading the strategy uh, that you all put out in like 2007, where really th these, these integrated military, economic, diplomatic, uh, and really value-based uh, missions. But Right now, in some ways, we are we're going back to the future, right? The, pre the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, talk about uh, a return to great power conflict, a return in many ways to 19th century views of the world. Uh, and I was struck, those of you who were at dinner last night know I'm a Game of Thrones fan, and uh, I, I hope, spoiler alert, but sorry. I mean, if you didn't see it last night, you had to be prepared. Uh, end of the uh, war against the Night King and back to great power conflict. We're back to conflict uh, among the nations. So when we talk about that now, we talk about China and Russia. Uh, and I wanted to ask you how you think about China and Russia and how, how, how alike. They're both powers that um, are adversarial to us in some ways, not in all ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they're also very different. Uh, and so how you think about that specific part of great power conflict? Well, there's certainly uh, a, a great deal of difference between those two uh, powers, and uh, particularly over time. You know, I think that uh, China growing very fast, becoming more and more global, uh, and uh, with, with, with tremendous ambitions, uh, Russia, uh, trying to you know, regain a, a near abroad security and uh, using a little bit different approach to, uh, to maintain their security, more asymmetric, I right. would say. And so uh, they, they uh, require a little bit different uh, approaches. 
Uh, but in general, I think the approach is the same. One is that uh, there are certainly areas where we have a lot of differences. And uh, in the discussions that I have, at least with my uh, peers uh, in China, uh, it's really about how do we mitigate and manage risk as we resolve these differences. The, the, it's going to be important to the future of the whole world how China and the United States resolve their differences in a way that uh, hopefully avoids conflict to, to the point that uh, you know, the president of Arizona State made in his opening remarks. Uh, and then uh, with respect to uh, Russia, you know, how do we just sort of, uh, sort of try and anticipate uh, the, these uh, moves that, uh, that Russia is making? But as, you, uh, as we are starting to think about it, <clears throat> it really exists along a spectrum of competition, right? And uh, we want to be trying to move things to the sort of lower kinetic end of that spectrum with every, every move that we make. There's a lot that goes into that. One, that we have to sort of be able to control the high end of spectrum so that we can de-escalate on, on our terms. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, just really do the hard analysis to, to sort of deconstruct each one uh, based on its own merits. You know, I'm interested when you, when you talk about uh, mitigating risk, and I think about, I know you, you have uh, regular dialogue with your Chinese counterpart, and we've learned those lessons of the last great power conflict. That there's great power conflict you can't avoid, but of course, World War I, much more where people are, are rising power, as with China now, where with the security dilemma, the risk of uh, mistake of misinterpretation yep. is as great as anything else. And so you can't stop the sort of head on, we want this territory, no, you can't have it. But you can stop the, I'm not sure what you mean, and I'm going to make decisions. No, I think you're exactly right. And so we spend a lot of time, we're obviously focused on things that happen at sea right. and, in, and near the sea. And so uh, what are those operational arrangements that are going to do everything we can to minimize the risk of miscalculation? So we have this code for unplanned encounters at sea, which is a communications protocol so that when U.S. ships and foreign ships, uh, and this is spreading to more and more navies as they adopt it, uh, okay, let's, let's talk to one another, let's arrange you know, a passing that's going to be predictable right. and safe and uh, not confrontational so that we minimize the risk of any kind of a miscalculation because it'll go the most tactical miscalculation will go strategic very, very fast, right? And then uh, to the point of responsive communications, if something like that should happen, one, by virtue of our time together, we can understand each other's thinking. So we can, and then we can get each other on the phone real quick and say, okay, this just happened. Let's not let this thing escalate you know, beyond where e e it's helpful for either one of us de-escalate and keep it in perspective. A quick text. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> WhatsApp. <laughs> um, so let's turn to technology. Uh, and this is uh, you, it's, uh, inevitable in all our lives, and particularly when we think about the future of conflict and the future of security. I was, I was very interested looking at your, your testimony uh, presenting the most recent budget, and Senator Inhofe, I think, basically said to you, you're taking the Harry S. Truman out. Why are you doing that? Uh, and you said, look, uh, we, you know, we need to, to use those funds for new technologies. And I want to invite you to talk about some of the specific technologies that, you, that the Navy's investing in and, and that you think about. Yeah. No, uh well, you know, Dr. Singer's up here. He just wrote a piece that I read this morning about this thing. And so one thing that characterizes success and failure, I think, is our ability to just move, right? The, the most mortal sin we can have right now is to stay stable or stagnant, right? right? And so uh, we're trying to move, and that's exactly the decision dynamic with respect to, hey, what's more uh, uh, relevant for the future? Is it going to be the Harry S. Truman and its air wing where there's a lot of innovation taking place, or is it going to be something else? And those technologies uh, are really right around the corner. Uh, you know, I, I note that it was a, scientific, a science fiction yeah. uh, award that we started with, and if you think about the time horizon of science fiction for the, you know for readers, it's it's steadily moved in. Whereas science fiction writers were used to write about a. 100 years in the future, 150 years in the future. Now it's like 25, 30 years in the future. Things, it's an indication that things are moving fast. So uh, the, you know, the Navy's 
also trying to move fast in these directions, uh, things like uh, unmanned uh, and autonomy, uh, artificial intelligence, things like directed energy, which I think are going to really be very decisive. Directed energy at energies that make a difference. Uh, I would say that... Uh, so you're going to have to explain to me a little more. Directed okay. energy... I think uh, lasers, okay. high-power microwave, okay. you know, electromagnetic energy right. in, a, in a focused way. In a focused mm -hmm. way, got it. It can ha uh, deliver either uh, sort of kinetic right. or non-kinetic right. effects. Uh, I would say that additive manufacturing and the ability to create things from printers, you know, from raw material, very decisive, particularly for the Navy, because we're always making these hard decisions, you know, what parts do I have to carry? Right. Uh, and, you know, we only have very limited space. Well, if I can make whatever part I need, uh, then uh, it's, a, it's a much different logistics thing for us. So, so, you know, these are the types of technologies that I think are going to have very decisive uh, uh, impact on the future. And then, you know, the, uh, the information systems that need to support it, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then, you know, how do we team all of that technology with people, which I think are really the, uh, that, that's the competitive edge of the future. The, the technology field, if, if we can maintain pace, is going to be uh, relatively even. Uh, so then it comes down to how we team with that technology as people to be more innovative, creative, et cetera. So I want to come to uh, your people, how you're training them, what you're offering them. But when you talk about these different technologies, one, of course, is they will all be connected. So even right. if you think about a 3D printer and, and all the things it has to be connected to. So that's part of how we're going to fight, but it's also part of your economic mission. So right. if we think about the Internet of Things and everything being connected, uh, that, you know, those connections go through under, underwater cables. Right? Right. So you're, when you now think about protecting our economy. It used to be protecting ships from the Barbary pirates. Yeah. It's now protecting cables. How do you think right. about that? And, you know, cables just being one part of sort of a national infrastructure exactly. that's all very, very vulnerable because it's all being run by some network, which is getting increasingly interconnected. Yes. And therefore, if you want to talk about a, uh, an attack surface is kind of the term of art, lots of ways to right. get into that. And so, uh, you know, so how do you manage all that, both the physical infrastructure and, uh, you know, I will tell you that it's not just under sea cables, but it's, you know, the technology has given us the ability to get to resources in deeper and deeper water. So there's a lot of uh, energy resources and a lot of infrastructure at the sea. It's one of the most dynamic parts of being uh, in the maritime domain right now. And then how do you protect all that? Sort of a seabed approach right. to uh, right. our thinking is uh, one way that we're getting after it. And so now, you know, to get down to that, well, think about a network of unmanned vehicles, remotely operated vehicles that can go down and hopefully uh, be uh, effective at securing all of that infrastructure. Wow, so, I mean, it, 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 yeah, that economic mission is so much bigger than protecting ships, even though right. protecting ships is still enormous. It's still a pretty big mission. So from undersea, <laughs> to outer space, because mm -hmm. you also talk about cyberspace and space right. as the two domains. We talked about mixed, right, mixed reality right there. How do you think about protecting our assets in space, and to what extent do you think about that? I, you know, the layman would say, well, surely that's the Air Force, but I know it's... No, we've got tremendous equities in space if you think about trying to maintain awareness and stay connected over, you know, over the, the vast... Uh, distances, particularly in the Pacific and the Atlantic, uh, you know, space very, very important to us. And so we're teaming very closely with all the other services. The Army has a tremendous uh, investment in equities in space as well. And then the idea of uh, this interconnectedness, uh, well, starts with the space architecture, but it really goes all the way down to each individual system as right. well. Right. And so thinking about the communication standards that are going to be required to really, truly connect this thing so that, uh, you know, as the Internet of Things comes real and, and, and it gets more and more uh, uh, ubiquitous, you know, we don't want to be left behind as the only kind of network of stuff that's not too networked, right? right. So we've got to think about all that. Mm -hmm. So I promised I'd, talk, I'd ask you to talk about people. And again, I mean, it's the, the size of, of your workforce, the range of things they have to do. I was fascinated. You have something called Sailor 2025. Right. Uh, and this idea also of 
offering your workforce flexible career options. I mean, as the head of a, a think tank and an action platform, I think about that all the time. I've got 60% millennials. They, their careers are changing in all sorts of different ways. Um, and so we think about how to offer that. But you've got a much, much bigger task. So I wanted to ask you, when you look forward at the future of the Navy, and the, also the need to have a very diverse workforce, because in many of the things that uh, you're thinking about, if you don't have a reflective workforce, you're not going to be able to do the AI the right way. You're not going to be able to really uh, think about, use uh, the technology in the full way that we need to. So how do you how, talk to us about Sailor 2025 and how you think about the future of your workforce? I'll tell you, Sailor uh, 2025 is really a suite of things that we're doing to really uh, move our human resources into the 21st century. And so you know, we had, uh, uh, and, and a lot of it starts with very sort of mundane things like, hey, we've got to refresh the information technology, right? So there's been a number of uh, events in the past two or three years that have honored uh, Admiral Grace Hopper, right? Yes. Great pioneer in computer science. And I think some of our personnel databases were actually written by Admiral Grace Hopper. I mean, they're that old. <laughs> they don't talk to one another. And uh, we were sort of the, uh, you know, the masters of small data, right? right? And so we've uh, got all that moving up into uh, the cloud now and with modern software, which allows us now to get down to the individual sailor and understand what that sailor's priorities are. Right, their professional priorities, what they want to do, their personal priorities, and uh, you know, everything about that person. And then we've got a, a proposition that we can make, consistent with meeting the needs of the Navy. Uh, if, let's say, a sailor just wants to run from one operational assignment to the next and just move, 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 I got a lot of jobs like that, so <laughs> I, I can help that person. If, on the other hand, uh, maybe a sailor and their family want to stabilize because they have children going through school, hey, listen, depending upon where you want to live, I can make you have some pretty good offers in that way. If you want to get educated yourself, we've got options there. And so, you know, what is the compensation package that we can meet up? And then how can we just eliminate all of the bureaucratic uh, inefficiencies to make this literally all done on your smartphone? And so that's what we want to do is deliver all of that uh, flexibility, transparency, control of a sailor's career to their smartphone. So that's just the human resources. Then you know, there's the training part. Right. And so as we think about technology, uh, another thing in the past uh, 20, 25 years, we've learned a tremendous uh, about, uh, amount about how people learn, right? right? And so we're bringing all of that uh, knowledge, technology assists, but also just the techniques through which information is presented, all of that bringing, you know, brought to bear and then again, you know, we're networking uh, our training venues as well. So you put on, you know, the uh, the, the goggles. Right. You're you're sitting in Norfolk. You're in the simulated cockpit of an F-18. Another sailor sitting in San Diego or Fallon, Nevada, and uh, they're all networked together, all fighting the same, uh, wow. you know, thing because the the training systems are networked together. You go to sea right now on a ship, and uh, you are presented a very complicated problem. Uh, with the rest of your strike group and fleet. Uh, half of that problem is real, so you look out on the horizon and there's the ship. When it, uh, half of that problem is completely simulated, and so this live and virtual mix in wow. terms of training opportunities gives us a chance to really ramp up the complexity of the scenarios and, uh, and make us uh, much better. You know, I'll tell you also, uh, kind of going back to where we started, uh, knock on wood, the Navy's met its recruiting goals for the past 12 and a half years every month. And uh, it's been uh, you know, a challenging thing. And uh, it, you, you sort of have to ask yourself, why is that? Right. I mean, I right. can't compete on salary. We have the most talented Navy by every measure of performance that we've ever had. And I think it goes back to that value proposition, Dr. Slaughter, that, uh, hey, we, they, they joined the Navy to do something noble. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that when they join, and they become part of that organization, that our walk is consistent with our talk, and that our behavior is consistent with our values. So.
Honorable and glorious. Honorable and glorious. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a few minutes uh, for, uh, for questions. I, it's hard for me to see who's got the microphone. Uh, and I'm just going to say whoever is controlling the clock, somebody needs to give me a, a hand sign when we're done, because the clock is not uh, telling me what I need to know. So floor is open. Yes. Keep your hand raised. There we go. Um, thank you, Admiral, for your service and for joining us here today. Um, Candace Rondeau, I'm a fellow with New America and a professor at ASU. Congratulations. Um, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I feel very lucky. Um, my question for you is actually, I recently took some, uh, a trip to Ukraine, uh, where we've seen uh, a lot of challenges on the Sea of Azov uh, and also on the Black Sea. Um, I'm wondering what lessons you and the Navy have taken away from this last period of confrontation uh, in that part of the world uh, I know that the USS Ross is um, patrolling now. Uh, we've had the, uh, Donald Cook there as well. Mm -hmm. um, what should we expect? Uh, what lessons should we take away? Um, and also, what does this mean for interoperability for, for NATO going forward, as well as for the Ukrainian Navy? Yeah, well, that's a heavy question. There's not enough time left on <laughs> to answer that. But I, I think uh, some of the big lessons from uh, that uh, episode, and, and many other like it, are that uh, one, I think it's uh, easy, but a mistake to think of this in terms of kind of a bilateral approach. Hey, what are we gonna do as the United States to uh, be more resilient to things like that? And, as, uh, and this happens, I think, both in the Atlantic, Mediterranean context, the NATO context, also in the Pacific as well, where it's really a regional approach that we have to take. And so, uh, one aspect of this is to make uh, all of our allies and partners in that region, I think, more resilient and, and resistant to those types of actions going forward. And so how do we all team together to respond uh, as, as an alliance or a team uh, rather than just make this sort of a bilateral thing? I think that's a, that's a vulnerability we really want to try and avoid. Uh, both, in, as I said, in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And then uh, it goes to this idea of response time as well. And so we've got to be able to respond or even better anticipate uh, these types of behaviors. In fact, in the ideal, we would want our competitors responding to our first move rather than always being in the response mode ourselves. And so uh, you know, if you think about that full uh, spectrum of competition, uh, we would want to hey, be making uh, plenty of first moves of our own uh, so that we can force the, the, the competitor to respond. Uh, and then you know, the, the decision cycle, we've got to be able to, uh, when, it, when we do have to respond, we've got to be able to do so on a time scale that's relevant, right? So that we can't let uh, one actor go in, you know, potentially establish a new normal, and then move on to the next thing before we've had a response to the first move. So we've got to uh, both think about this as making the region more resilient to these types of things so that uh, one would give a great deal of thought before trying something like that. And then when they happen, be a little bit uh, more responsive. I think the building resilience point is, again, I mean, whether you're thinking about climate or you're thinking, but, but as, as such as a core part of how we think about the future of our security is, right. is, is really a key point. Here in the front. Sir, George Nicholson with the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. A little over a year ago at the Atlantic Council, General Neller said our biggest threat in the future for the Marine Corps is our dependence upon GPS and SATCOM. And he talked about being in Afghanistan the year before, I mean the month before, asking one of his Marines where was something on the map. And they, he said, they looked at me like I was a dinosaur and said, we don't use maps. I think about th two or three weeks later, you made the comment that you had the same problem uh, in, the, in, the, in the Navy. And I think that you said that you asked the question about can we use sextants? We're told we stopped using sextants a year ago. How do you see this problem being resolved? Yeah. Well, the, the problem, I think, comes under a, a group of problems that we call, uh, I think it's uh, positioning, navigation, and timing, right, a PNT. And uh, because we, you know, the other thing is we just got to make an acronym for it. So um, <laughs> the, uh, the challenge of posi uh, positioning, navigation, and timing is going to, uh, I think it's, 
we're making good progress there, right? This is an area where technology is helping us. There's a lot of these positioning systems up in, uh, in space and, and, and uh, geo types of uh, approaches to this. I think that all of our systems should be able to use all of them, right? And so that it makes it more robust if we're gonna use kind of those electronic navigations uh, types of systems. And then you know, we have returned to celestial navigation and some of those things, which technology here, we could do better than a sextant right now uh, in terms of getting a, a star fix. And so it's the combination of all of those things that uh, will make us be more resilient. Uh, your, your question, though, sort of uh, elicits a, a kind of a broader matter, which is uh, we've talked a lot about the network today, and uh, that network, of course, is going to be the first point of attack, I think, if uh, w when, when conflict starts to move to the higher end of that uh, spectrum. And uh, ours is not going to be 100 percent resilient to all that. We, we can expect ours to degrade. Uh, but our hope is that, uh, and, and our goal, is that uh, while ours degrades, it won't degrade as much as theirs. And uh, at the lowest point of connectivity uh, or, or, or be performance, uh, we'll be better than our adversaries, and then we'll heal faster. And so it's really you know, thinking about that information space, whether it's navigation, whether it's communication, uh, it, that's contested battle space right now. And uh, thinking about some of those fundamental ideas of contested space, uh, those principles will do us well in this space as well. Good. Um, there, over there. Hello, Admiral. Uh, Pete Monsoor. I'm a professor of military history at The Ohio State University. What are your concerns that the Navy hasn't engaged in a major blue water uh, conflicts since the Battle of Leyte Gulf in 1944. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking the parallel here would be the Royal Navy between Trafalgar and Yutland doesn't see a lot of blue water com conflict. And then at Yutland, it doesn't do very well because its culture had ossified. How do you prevent that from happening uh, in the United yeah. States Navy? I'll tell you, it's a, uh, it's a real challenge. And you know, there's that great book, uh, Rules of the Game, that talks exactly about that problem. Uh, for the Royal Navy and has tremendous lessons for us in terms of uh, the culture of command and uh, freedom of action, the ability to innovate. Uh, you know, I was just up at Newport last night and uh, talked to the uh, course that we teach to future Joint Force Maritime Component Commanders. We talked exactly about this, right? And then uh, we went to dinner uh, with a bunch of the prospective commanding officers that are going to go out and command ships. And we talked exactly about this. And so it's a matter of uh, how are you training, right? Uh, I mean, that's the best that we can do, Pete, is just sort of make our training as challenging and prototypic as we possibly can, including the decision structures and the challenges that are going to poke right at that problem that you just talked about. And then, uh, you know, what is the response? And what is the ability of each of our commanders at every level to sort of think on their own, innovatively, creatively, uh, use their initiative, exercise the full scope of the authorities that we have given? Uh, because I think what happens in uh, these uh, long periods without exercising those muscles, it, we just, you know, just like an athlete, we sort of get out of shape. And so we're trying to push out an exercise, but I'm mindful you know, you mentioned Leyte Gulf at the beginning of World War II, uh, even after Pearl Harbor, even after Guadalcanal, you know, we were still learning on the fly at, you know, at great cost, right, uh, in combat. And so, uh, you know, I'm mindful that every opportunity we can to make that training more uh, representative of the complexity of, of the challenge we face will get us closer and then we've got to sort of build in that resilience and toughness and I guess humility to understand that we're not gonna get it all perfect and we're still gonna have to fight through that transition. Great question. Yes. Uh, Chris Wolf, BBC. Uh, I'm sure you're not gonna be any Admiral Jellicoe, sir. But um, the, um, uh, we talked a little bit about um, great power competition uh, but a lot of smart people have been talk talking about um, 
John Bolton, for example, pushing towards a conf confrontation with Iran. So I was wondering, you know, what your advice might be uh, when that issue comes up. <laughs> That's a softball. I think, uh, well, it, it, the United States is a global power, right? And uh, I, one of the lessons that we have uh, learned, we have to internalize, is that every time we try and focus on one thing too much without maintaining a balanced perspective, uh, that, uh, well, there's vulnerabilities associated with that. People will, you know, steal a march on us in our blind spots. And then uh, I think, uh, particularly with the uh, Middle East and, and other areas, the importance of allies and partners is uh, even more, made more uh, manifest. And so uh, building those meaningful networks where we're sharing, you know, not only kind of military capability, but every time we get together with our uh, allies and partners in any kind of an international contest, it's really like, hey, when are we gonna, how much more information can we share, right? So that we can get out in front of this, start to be in the anticipatory phase of things rather than the reactionary phase of things. And then, uh, so, so I think that that's a, you know, a big part of the solution. And then as we think about sort of, you know, uh, those adversaries identified in the national defense strategy, uh, we've got to watch out for any kind of alliances between them. So, you know, China, Iran, uh, Russia, Iran, those sorts of things. Uh, those types of uh, alliances only complicate our problem as well. With somebody in the back there? No? Peter. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Roll. Uh, you started off, I'm Tom Squitteria with Talk Media News. Uh, you began your comments uh, about communication on the high seas between navies and over the weekend, uh, two U.S. ships again went through the Taiwan Strait. This year, there have been an increased number of freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. Of course, you know of the incident last fall where it appeared a Chinese vessel was going to ram a U.S. vessel. Can you talk a little bit about the South China Sea in regards to the communication aspects that you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks and how to avoid an accidental ramming or something like that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I was pretty complete when I uh, talked about it. It's really just an operational construct that uh, in the vast, vast majority of encounters that we see in the South China Sea and everywhere else that you mentioned, uh, we both parties behave, all parties, really, because it's bigger than just the two of us, uh, behave consistently with those, uh, with those arrangements. And so, uh, in fact, that's one of the things that uh, we, we uh, stress quite a bit uh, when I last visited China was this responsibility that we have to make sure that we train our commanding officers who have so much responsibility on their shoulders to make sure that, hey, if we're not, if we don't consider ourselves enemies, uh, well, let's not treat ourselves like enemies. Let's pass uh, peacefully uh, in the South China Sea or wherever, and uh, let's not make it hard to abide by these uh, constructs and pass peacefully. So let's not try and drive erratically in front of one another. Let's try and not throw obstacles in front of uh, each other, et cetera. And it's the responsibility of those commanding officers to make sure that they make a very measured approach in this. And then it's the responsibility of higher echelon commanders to teach that and hold the commanding officers responsible. And so uh, you know, I think that that's about all that's said there. Hey, the South China Sea, a very important body of water for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, the United States as well. About a third of the world's trade flows through that body of water, and so it's extremely important that as we advocate for continued freedom of navigation through there and other international uh, waters like the Taiwan Straits, uh, that uh, we're mindful that we've got a tremendous economic uh, uh, interests in that uh, as a maritime nation. I have to say, for all our talk about mixed reality and virtual reality, you go to Singapore, you look out your hotel room, you see all those ships lined yeah. up, right, about to go to the streets, and it's, yeah. it just reminds you how physical it is and, and how much we do rely on these, these very narrow passageways. No, yeah, you, and you can map them out through the world. There's the Malacca Straits where you were talking about, there's Hormuz, there's exactly. Bab el-Mendeb, there's Gibraltar, there's Suez, uh, Panama, you know, you can just sort of uh, take a look at them. and. You know, geography is still destiny exactly. in many ways. <laughs> you can't simulate that away. Yeah. Peter. Uh, 
Peter Singer with New America. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question maybe less likely to get you in trouble than um, Bolton and Iran policy. Uh, <laughs> I thought I sort of finessed it. Yeah, yeah. You, you navigated around it, but, but maybe tougher. I'm it's still the CNO at the end of the day. Well, no. <laughs> it, it actually goes back to the prior question about um, naval warfare 100 years ago. So one of the challenges of that period that you face now is that there were a set of technologies, a set of platforms, some of which had been dominant, were still believed to be dominant. Yeah. You know, that was the last great dreadnought battle, and yet wasn't moving forward. You had other technologies that were uh, not yet realized to be as powerful as they would be, aircraft carrier, submarine. Mm -hmm. And then you had a third category of ones akin to the like the blimp aircraft carrier that seemed like it was the future and yet it was like a false alley. So right. as you're planning the Navy of 2030, how are you navigating these questions yeah. of which kind of investments to make? How are you testing them? How are you visioning this? No, that's a great question. And so uh, it's very central to our approach right now. And uh, so I'll just tell you a story and I, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but there's this number 10,000 that's out there and gets a lot of play, right? So if you think about 10,000, I was out in uh, Whidbey Island just last week at where we have a, a lot of our electronic attack squadrons. So this is a, a new area, right, that's uh, proving more and more valuable. And they had this uh, quote on the wall of their uh, building that talked about, hey, uh, it's a Thomas Edison quote, right? I didn't make 10,000 mistakes. I just learned 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. So there's 10,000 <laughs> uh, in that context in terms of experimentation. Uh, you know, if you read uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about the 10,000 hours, right, that it takes to become an expert. Uh, I, I feel like oftentimes I'm trapped in a world of 10,000 briefs, right, <laughs> where it takes 10,000 briefs to kind of get the consensus and the group of uh, uh, fellow travelers to come together with a unity of effort. Uh, that's the way it's not going to work, right? And so I would, as we think about all of these technologies uh, and in the context of the Navy as a learning engine, a you know, global learning engine, uh, I would say that, uh, as always, uh, we want to move forward on an evidence-based approach. And so the more that we can get out and test these concepts in every possible way, some we test by analyzing them a little bit more, some we test by wargaming them uh, you know, up in Newport or wherever, some we test by going out and doing a fleet experiment. We actually get on the water and check it out. But we've got to make sure that when the nation's security is involved, that we're not making a leap of faith, right? So some people use this uh, battleship to aircraft carrier example as a, uh, as a pivotal moment for the Navy, and I suppose it was. But uh, hey, there was 20 years of experimentation with naval aviation that prepared us for that time, right? And so it wasn't like we just sort of invented it on the fly. We had a lot of evidence and, uh, and, and tactical development and technological development. And so as we move forward, uh, we've got to make sure that we continue those experiments, those prototypes, that refining. And we have to be mindful that, uh, hey, this exponential pace of change is getting more and more rapid. So also our, our pace of experimentation needs to get more and more rapid so that we don't fall behind. So you know, I'd much rather be in the 10,000 experiments realm uh, than the 10,000 brief realm. Well, that is a perfect note on which to end. Okay. Uh, and we thank you. It's the perfect kickoff to a day of discussion about the future of security. Well, so thank, thank you, you for, very much. Thanks for having us. It's great to be together.